Welcome back to an instant reaction edition of the Night Report podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite and Chris Nolaski, beat writer for Rutgers. Guys, uh, we got a big commitment today, the class of 2024 for football. Uh, Rutgers has found its quarterback for the class in Notre Dame High School's A.J. Serace. Um, he was a guy that Rutgers seemed to be going after hard with Sean Gleason, given the connections with the Princeton staff. Uh, Bob Serace, the Princeton head coach, is A.J.'s dad. Um, but we weren't sure if that was going to be a guy who would even show interest in Rutgers, but uh, apparently he does because he just committed. We're also going to talk the, the big time win at MSG yesterday uh, for Rutgers over Michigan State. Uh, Rutgers showed out big time in the Big Apple. They won 61 to, to 55. But uh, let's talk this commitment first. Um, I truly thought that that door was closed when Sean Gleason got fired in October. Um, I guess we, we kept recruiting him, though, and I, I imagine Kirk Sraka must have watched his tape and met with him and really liked him as well uh, to take this commitment. Um, but, but tell us a little bit about what we're getting in this kid, Richie. Um, yeah, so AJ Serace, uh, Notre Dame High School uh, kid. Uh, it's There's a guy who shall not be named anymore that used to go there and played for Rutgers. Um, <laughs> it's it's Taekwon Underwood played there. Um, I, I don't remember them actually producing that much after Taekwon. I think AJ might be like the next Power 5 kid, to be honest. Um, that's just off the top of my head. I'm probably wrong in that regard, but whatever. Um, he's a, he's a solid quarterback, uh, athletic bloodlines. His sister plays lacrosse at Columbia. His dad's the head coach of Princeton. Uh, very smart family, obviously. Number one, uh, number two, his dad's been the head coach of Princeton for years on end. So he knows the game of football. He grew up around the game of football. Um, like you mentioned, he was very close with Sean Gleason, but he was also close with An Andrew Ulrich, who was uh, obviously at Princeton as well for a couple of years under Bob Serace. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Kirk kind of just saw his tape from what I'm told. And Rutgers was kind of pushing him from the get-go. Uh, yeah, they, they aimed high for where guys like Michael Van Buren, who was on campus a couple times, Daniel Kalin out of Nebraska was on campus once or twice, I believe. Um, but but they got A.J. Serace, and it's, he's probably one of, if not Jersey's best quarterback in this class, I think. Um, he's, he's a decent kid, and, uh, decent arm strength. Could be a little bit better. He's working on stuff like that. Uh, trains with Tony Rassiopi, who the program with uh, who the program and fans are probably very familiar with. Uh, he's trained Gavin Wimstad. He's trained Jarek Warantano. He's trained Kenny Pickett. He's trained. The list just keeps going on and on. He trained Art Sikowski, who another probably who shall not be named ever again. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, he seems like a decent kid. He puts the ball where it has to be. He's got a high IQ, high football IQ, and. Uh, I mean, I, I think he's he's a solid get. It's it's a decent get for Rutgers, and uh, you get your quarterback locked up pretty early, and that's usually the leader of the class. So let's see if he can uh, convince another, a couple other Jersey guys to stay home. Yeah, Rivals does have him listed as the top quarterback in New Jersey uh, for the class of 2024. He's ranked 17th mm -hmm. overall in the state. He has offers uh, that are listed from Boston College, Indiana, Michigan State, Northwestern, Pittsburgh, Obviously, Rutgers, Temple, Toledo, and a few others. Um, he's been to a lot of camps. He's played a lot of football in his life. He's a coach's son. I think this is the kind of kid that will have it mentally down pretty quick because of how much football he's played and how much exposure he's had to the game. Um, I do agree, though, that uh, he does have a few things to work on. This isn't a kid who probably plays early, but this is a kid who, after a few years of development, getting in a college strength and conditioning program, um, that he could potentially be a starter one day. Um, if you see his tape, uh, once he takes his helmet off, he's got a baby face still. He's, he's definitely, you know, a 16, 17 year old kid. So he's, he's got a, he's got to grow into his body a bit. I think he's, he's listed at like six, two. Um, he looks about that, maybe a little shorter. Um, mm -hmm. so this is a kid that, uh, physically once he starts developing, uh, I think maybe two, three years down the line, that's when he can actually uh, make a contribution possibly. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. It's similar to um, Johnny Shepard. I think these are developmental guys that are going to take a couple years yep. in the program. Work under Kirk. Um, I don't think Kirk's going anywhere being paid what he is. Like, that's just... I don't think so either. It's it's a very obvious statement. Like, I don't think he gets a, a head coaching job anytime soon. I think he likes being an OC. I think he's, like, one of those longtime assistant coaches now at this point in his career. Um, so he'll be working with him for, for the long haul, it seems like. Um and I, I think that Kirk being the guy he is with developing quarterbacks, I think this is a, it's a solid piece. And you, you get another Jersey kid, you build another pipeline or start another pipeline uh, from another New Jersey school. Mind you, they don't 
produce as much, but just to have Jersey kids. And if they succeed on the field, you can kind of pitch the whole, like, look, look what we're doing with this kid. Look what we're doing with that kid. Um, and it kind of just goes from there. And then you got, ideally he, he's, he's a pretty talkative kid. So I, I think he could be the leader of this class. I know we kind of don't determine that until like a couple months down the road when we kind of hear who's talking about who and who's recruiting who. But uh, I think he could be the leader in this class. Um, he's already got Kenny Jones in front of him with one one commitment as offensive lineman. Gabriel Winowich is a kind of a leader a little bit too. Uh, so I mean, this it's a good start to the class. You got some some good targets, and we already spent another future cast for uh, Corey Duff over in New York. So. And we're probably close to submitting one for Caden Brown as well. I'll, I'll just say it. Like, I know I hinted that on the boards, and if you haven't figured it out by now, like, it's Caden Brown <laughs> who I'm hinting at. Like, mm-hmm. um, we also have a future cast for Dominic Toy out of Pennsylvania, whose uh, OC is Demir Shaw's brother. And his other, the other recruiting coordinator is Demir Shaw's other brother. So, I mean, it sounds like Rutgers is a, uh, you're starting to see where Rutgers is going with this class. And uh, it's starting to fill in pretty nicely. Now you got to get bigger up front. I still think uh, on both sides. Like, Caden Brown's a nice get. Yes, he's on the edge, which is a good sign for defense. But offensively, you got to land, like, a Colin Coverley or Marcus Harrison or a Marquise Easley, Caleb Brewer. Those are just some of the big names right now. And you got to land a couple of these guys. Um, that's where it's going to come down to if this class is a, su- eh, a success or not. I can't talk. Jeez. Yeah, and so he goes to Notre Dame High School, like we've alluded to. They obviously produced uh, Taekwon Underwood back in the mm-hmm. class of, like, 2000. Five, I want to say, um, but they haven't produced a ton of uh, high-level talent there. Yeah, he's part of the class of 2005. So they had a kid in Jason Jenkins go to Tennessee in the class of 2022. You were right. I forgot about him. But was, other than that, really yeah, good. they haven't they haven't had a, an FBS kid, according to Rival, since 2011 prior to that. So is there anybody else on his team that we should be aware of, or is this uh, is this not really a football powerhouse? I wouldn't say it's a football powerhouse. They have a, a guy who's a little bit smaller. He's a wide receiver DB, like athlete type, whatever you want to call him. Jordan mm-hmm. Scipio, Scipio, if I, I should pronounce that. Okay. Right. Um, he's a little on the smaller side, but it's a potential like PD, PWO down the line, maybe. Uh, other than that, I don't, I don't really think they have anyone else. Um, it is interesting, and I'm just looking at this now. So correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> when was Kirk at Western Michigan? He was there from 2013 to 2016. Yeah, it wasn't 2011. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Take it back because there's a kid. Yeah, he was still at. Where went to Western? Yeah, Michigan. he. In 2011, that was his first year as Rutgers OC. Okay. The second year was 2012, and uh, actually gotcha. maybe it was 2010 and 11. So it was the second year as OC in 2011. You're correct. Yes. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, they, they don't produce a ton of talent. But like I said, this is a Jersey kid, one of the better Jersey kids. So you're starting to see a Jersey-laden recruiting class, and you might be able to top it off with Shim Willis, who's number one right now for us. So That would be huge. Nice. Um, so it's a good start to this class. It's always nice to get your quarterback squared away early on because mm-hmm. uh, usually those are the guys who – the quarterbacks, they have natural leadership skills. Most of the time they're the ones who are you know, getting guys – together to throw or getting guys together on campus or, you know, arranging, you know, to get friends of friends. Cause all these kids know each other these days, especially with like how many seven on seven teams there are, how many times these kids bounce around from school to school, you know, how many like kids who actually grew up in the same town, but they just go to different schools, you know, 10 miles away from each other. And I mean, right in that area, uh, the Hun school's closed. Lawrenceville perhaps is really closed. Petty school is really closed. Mm-hmm. So all those kids I'm sure know each other, um, especially with, Bob Serace being his dad, also recruiting a ton of these kids. AJ definitely knows kids, so. Yeah, we'll I, I wanted to add to that. that. I wanted to add to that real quick before anyone panics. He's probably going to take unofficials to Princeton at some point. Not an unofficial, <laughs> but he's going to be at Princeton, I'm sure. So relax. Uh-huh. Like, it ain't happening. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure if he was going to go to Princeton, he probably already would have committed there. Um, yeah. He's course. been recruited for 16, 17 years now, I'm sure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty um, much it, yeah. So. All right, so stay tuned. I'm sure there will be more that comes out of this commitment. Uh, Richie uh, is probably mm-hmm. going to talk to him at some point today to get more, yes. but we just wanted to give you guys the, the instant reaction to this. Um, let's mm-hmm. talk hoops, though. We had a huge win yesterday, avenging the earlier mm-hmm. in the season loss against Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State in that game famously shot 55% on high volume from three against Rutgers, and Rutgers lost by 11, I want to say. Uh, much different story yesterday. Uh, it looked like they were setting the game, offensive game of basketball back uh, several decades in the first half. 
before they decide to start scoring points. But uh, it was a tight game until late in the second half where Rutgers just kind of started to pull away. Um, you guys were both at the guard. You had two different vantage points due to some uh, press box stuff. But uh, Chris, you talk first. What, <laughs> uh, what did you see out of the game yesterday that really impressed you? Yeah, so, um, you know, before we even talk about that, man, I was, um, you know, getting on the train. Obviously, the train was full of Rutgers fans. Um, I saw, I, the whole time I saw two Michigan State fans walk past, and that, and that was it. Uh, you know, it was it was obviously I, I got in from New Brunswick, so there was a lot of Rutgers fans there, students, and everything getting on the train. So, um, but yeah, Rutgers came out in full force. I mean, uh, there was almost fifteen thousand in the arena, and I'd say it was maybe like eighty five percent Rutgers there. It, it was loud, um, you know. So they obviously showed out for the game. Um, obviously, was, there was all talk about um, you know having you know Rutgers being the quote unquote home team for the game and how they're giving up a game at the rack, but. Um, obviously, it wasn't quite quite the rack, but, you know, the Rutgers fans still made it loud there. Um, I had a decibel meter, and it got up to about 104 at some point. So um, that's that's pretty rack-esque, I guess you could say. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, Greg Shannon was there. Pat Hobbs was there, obviously. There was a lot of Rutgers fans there. Um, it was a sea of red, really. There was, like, a little bit of green kind of in, like, the one corner by their bench, but that was really it. And, um, yeah, just going along with the game. Um, yeah, I thought Mawa Mag really was was Rutgers in in, in the first half until they got hurt. Uh, it was a shame he got hurt. Um, I wrote about it. I asked Puckel after the game. There's no update on him really right now, but um, he's going to see see doctors today. But um, yeah, I mean, like Richie said in in the beginning, the shooting was bad for both teams. Um, but Mag was really he was really the, all the Rutgers offense. He was playing well defensively. Um, he made his first two or three shots, I want to say, and then everyone else was like 0 of 13, um, 0 of 14, uh, until Andre Hyde finally made a bucket. But um, yeah, they they clamped down. I mean, I mean, Michigan State went up when it was the halftime with I want to say a six point lead around there. Um, they had the you know steal in the in the bucket right at the buzzer, which obviously I saw Caleb McConnell. He he looked crushed after that. Uh, but you know, obviously with Mag being out, they had to change up what they wanted to do. They got the ball to Cliff to start the second half. He did really well getting inside uh, a couple of N1s, dunks, layups. Um, and then you saw, you know, Caleb McConnell, Paul McKay, he really step up and had that veteran presence. Um, you know, Paul McKay he just like, took over at the end of the game, getting to the hoop. Um, even, even Tom Izzo, uh, Michigan State coach, was, you know, they credited him uh, for being able to attack the basket. Caleb McConnell um, switched up his defense on Hauser, who was really killing Rutgers early in the game. And, uh, he was able to shut them down. Um, and then, you know, Rutgers earlier in the game, they just didn't make the free throws. But um, towards the end, you know, last two minutes or so, Michigan State kept fouling uh, Rutgers to kind of, you know, slow the game down and hopefully make the miss and make buckets themselves. And Rutgers did a really solid job with the line there. And um, even even freshman Derek Simpson came in and uh, he played a lot of minutes down the stretch and made it, and made his free throws when they mattered. So, um, he you know, him and Paul had that little gaff, I guess, uh, toward the end with a couple seconds left, but um, I, it didn't hurt Rutgers at the end. And then uh, I like that Cliff was able to get that last uh, you know, last second block there. <laughs> yeah, I do want to shout out Cliff there, the, the true hero of the game, because anybody who is in New York and a Rutgers fan who finally got to bet on the Scarlet Knights, or maybe, you know, got to pre previously, <laughs> but I imagine it was a lot of Rutgers fans' first experience being able to go to a game, game like day of and bet on the game. The line bounced around between three and a half and four the last couple days. Uh, settled in at four and a half. So Rutgers is up six there with about five seconds left. And uh, yeah, Derek Simpson just throws the ball away and Paul's looking at him like he's like, you know, about to rip his head off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Cliff does what any true superhero does. And, you know, he blocks the shot and he keeps the Rutgers up by six going on. And Rutgers ends up winning by six. Uh, if they would have made that layup, they would have lost, uh, lost the game because good you know, good teams win, great teams cover. Uh, Rutgers <laughs> cover the game. So big shout out to Cliff. Um, like someone predicted that in a war room. Weird. I'm out of a good week in predictions. <laughs> predicted what? That Cliff would block a last minute shot to, to no, keep no, no, the, no. Uh, the points that the, alive? That they would cover and win. So Yeah, yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it, it didn't look good in the first half after Matt oh, got it. It didn't look good in the first half, though. I mean, the under still hit. It was 124 yeah. and a half or 126 and a half. I forget what I tweeted out. And I was, the first half, I'm like, yeah, nope, that ain't hitting. Like, there's mm -hmm. nowhere. 
Um, two, two real quick thoughts. Now, number one, I, I know I kind of um, crush Paul from time to time for his uh, outburst, I guess. But that man showed true leadership on the court, even pregame. Like, I noticed he, him just getting everyone hyped up, getting everyone in the right state of mind um, and all that. And then even during the game, like, he, he bounced back. He got everyone, like I, like you said, he kind of didn't yell at Derek, but like, hey, man, you mm-hmm. just got to do this better. You can't, you can't be doing that shit. I like, can't just throw the ball away. Um, but no, credit to Paul for being a true leader on and off the court or, or on the court during the game and po- uh, pregame as well. And then he showed a lot of maturity in postgame too. He sounded like uh, all, all they care about is, uh, is winning. And I, it's fair enough. I know uh, what uh, Izzo mentioned it too. He's like, these guys just, they just, they're a different breed. They just don't care. Like they don't care about this. They don't care about that. They just win, 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 which yep. on top of that, Izzo had some fucking weird quotes, man. That guy is a quote yeah. machine though. What the, the Flintstones yeah. you compared him to at one point, I think he called Pico quirky or something, something like that. Like yeah. that. He, said his, was, he said his personality was, is funky. Kind of like guy, uh, Guy next door, but also with some orniness. Like, what? What are you? What are you off your meds, dude? Like, what? Yeah, where sorry. are all these? Guy, and, guy next door. First yeah. thing, and like the, everyone the funniest, thinks, and it's like. And the funniest part about that, he was trying to think of a quote for Pipe. It took like a like a fifteen second pause to think of one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was just the weirdest thing like I've ever heard. That and then there, what? Then he's like, every time I play Rutgers, I I just you know sometimes like if I or no 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 what it was I, I take it back. He's like, yeah, if I was Rutgers, I, w- I would play at MSG every year. Like why wouldn't you? But like, and if, especially if you win. But if you lose, it's like you want to slit your th- wrists. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's still bad. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can't say that. Like, cool. You can't. I'm just sitting there. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I looked at. Yeah, Richard was recording. I looked at him. I was like, whoa, <laughs> dude. Like, oh my god, that was that was a rough one. Like, I don't know where you're going with this, but. Okay, I guess that's just yeah. There's still time rock. to retreat from what you're trying to say here, buddy. This is uh, <laughs> not sounding good nor looking good. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was something. Oh my god. Um, so I found something out interesting about the game too. Is technically they didn't because there was a lot of games on Saturday in terms of high schools, and it's also mm-hmm. noon. They can host recruits there. Yeah. So in the future, I think you're still doing it. Well, can we talk through you know that whole debacle like? How did this go from a neutral site game to a Rutgers home game seemingly overnight? Does anybody know the answer to that? No, that I don't understand whatsoever. And the NCAA, or not the NCAA, I think the Big Ten just clarified. It's like, yeah, no, it's a Rutgers home game. Like, was it a a Michigan home game when we had it a few years ago? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But they were home, but I don't know for quad rankings. And I don't think there was, like, the net or something like that. So there wasn't, like, it was considered neutral, though, for that or something. No. Because, I mean, if it's going to be a Rutgers home game, like, there's two main things I could think why that's beneficial for Rutgers. And they're both kind of, like, they're both kind of, like, I don't know. One's financial. Like, do you get the, all the take from everything? Like, the tickets? Do you get, like, a slice of the all the, the concessions? And also the recruiting aspect. You could basically treat it like you're on campus and therefore mm-hmm. like have a recruiting section, have all these kids coming to the game for free. I don't get the sense that they did that. Um, because if you look at all the different, you know, pageantry of the game, Michigan State's pep band was there. They had their cheerleading crew. They had their mascot right on the baseline. Mm-hmm. Like this felt like a neutral site game from yep. everything other than, you know, what it was designated as. Like, that was always going to be a packed game for Rutgers fans, regardless of who was selling tickets or whatnot, because, you know, we're an hour away. Michigan State is, you know, a three-hour plane ride away. So I, I don't know. I That whole situation just really kind of irks me. Um, not, not because it's like a quad two versus quad one, but it's just stupid. Like, if you're going to make it a Rutgers home game, let Rutgers totally control it. Don't allow the fucking pet band from Michigan State there. Don't let their cheerleaders be on the baseline. Like, that is not... We would never allow that at Rutgers. Why would we allow that at a neutral site that it was being treated as a home game? That is total bullshit. Yeah, that's a good point. Super I actually, didn't even thought about that with all the pet band yeah. and mascot and stuff. I didn't even think about that. But oh. yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, we got we got a special guest. You finally woke up. I did. What's up, Craig? <laughs> yep. What's going on, Steve? Yeah. Uh, give credit to Craig because he's the one who wanted to get together, and uh, I didn't see my phone last night, and uh, he also. Uh, 
I guess uh, had a little bit of a, a late late morning here, but uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Craig. What'd you do after the game? You go out and drink? <laughs> no, this is just like one of the few times in the week I can sleep in. So, no, yeah, fair that's fair. <laughs> All right, Craig. So you were at the game last night, as yesterday, or sorry, not last night, geez, but yesterday afternoon as well. Um, we kind of went over, you know, the train ride in. What, what was something that really impressed you about the game yesterday? Ah, uh, uh, there's a lot. There's a couple things, but I would say first. Go through it all say, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would don't say, say anything first. about the Knicks. Don't even don't. don't <laughs> yeah, they, they lost. Don't worry about it. I mean, at least one metro, you know, at least one local basketball team, you know, won at the Garden yesterday. New York's team won yesterday. That's all. all yeah. that matters. <laughs> yeah, the that? Nets. The Nets won. You didn't see that? Oh, I said Nets New York's won. team. The Rutgers. No, Rutgers is New York's team now. Come on. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but I would just say first off, uh, the turnout. I was like so impressed. I mean. I was so, I was so impressed with the turnout. Like me and Chris were talking about on the train ride in, it was just we, there was so much just scarlet. Every, like everybody, yeah. like almost everybody in the train was wearing like Rutgers gear. There was like maybe a few Michigan State fans we saw, but really it was probably like the the, the building was like we said like eighty to ninety percent was the was the ratio of Rutgers to you know Michigan State, and I think that's accurate. I think there was a lot of very good uh, Rutgers turnout, which. I know a lot of people were upset about giving up the uh, game of Jersey Mike. So the thing that me really upsets me, like I think me more than giving up just the home game was the fact that it was considered a home game. To me, that was just dumb. Yeah. Like, like, you, like, I don't know, just that I was whatever. But Rutgers won, so I guess I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> but um, I think going once, a, I think like once a year going to the Garden isn't the worst thing in the world because like I think it's a great idea. Yeah, home, I mean, personally. it's still it's not like you know like me. <laughs> Me and Chris drove ten hours to Dayton to watch Rutgers, so I think I, I think I think a train like a train ride to the Garden, like you know, maybe once a year isn't the worst thing in the world. I know tickets are a little bit usually a little bit pricier, but it's kind of you know it's the Garden, so that's kind of is what it is. But yeah, I think I think once a year at the Garden, whether it's a conference game or even if it's a non-conference game, whether you want to play like I don't know, like UConn for example, or a Temple, something like that, once a year isn't the worst thing in the world. You know that way you can kind of build more of that New York connection because as we saw yesterday, Rutgers does have a very good uh, New York, like the, people will travel to see Rutgers and there's probably, I would think there's probably people in New York who are Rutgers fans. So I just mm -hmm. think it's a good connection they can continue to build uh, going forward. So that was, I guess, the, the one thing that really impressed me. And then another thing was just Rutgers game. I mean, I, to be honest, you saw in the war room, I kind of picked, I don't know. I just had a feeling this was a game kind of like the first with the game where it was like Michigan State's kind of a tough matchup for Rutgers because they both play a very aggressive, you know, style of defense. They're very long. And we saw in the game that the first game, Rutgers really dominated the boards. And this game, this flip kind of script where it was like now Michigan State was kind of getting those offensive boards. But um, credit to Rutgers that in the end, it didn't really affect them. And even they lost from Watt Mag in the first half. And you'd think, wow, this, and they were losing. Or maybe not at the time they lost Mag, but then they fell down into halftime and they were losing. It's like, wow, this is going to be a really uphill battle for Rutgers to climb the win. But even without Moat Mag, which I don't know, if we, have you guys heard anything about him? I, I haven't heard anything so far, at least. Um, the latest, it's it's a rumor. I'm just going to throw it out there. It might be confirmed at this point. It might not be. Um, I don't think we'll hear anything until Monday, to be honest. But uh, yeah. there's a rumor. It's ACL or MCL, and they don't know if it's a sprain or tear. Obviously, the MRI will tell you what it is exactly. So it's just That's a matter right. of waiting for that. And uh, Obviously, the hope is probably, I mean, <clears throat> a sprain, because a sprain mm -hmm. would probably, that wouldn't keep him out for the rest of the year. Right? They, obviously, it's horrible. Keep him out for a month, probably. A month, yeah. Least, That's yeah. kind of like the yeah. next, to me, that's kind of like the Zach Wilson, he had, or his was like a slight tear, but it was more mm -hmm. of a sprain where they came, where they went in and kind of cleaned it out a little bit, and he was able to come back in like a month, like a month. I think it was like a month or yeah. a longer, but that's again, that's the hope. But I guess we'll see. But yeah, as as I was saying, is that even without Mont Mag, the team still went on and still beat a quality team like Michigan State, and credit to them. And this is as big as maybe not this, maybe not to the level of the Purdue one, but this is probably your second biggest win of the year. And like Izzo said at the end of the game, you know, Rutgers, he said, I mean, he said it, Rutgers is the second best team in the Big Ten to him. And that's just probably almost the ultimate compliment you can get from a Hall of Fame coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah he sure. Said, he said Rutgers is the second best team and they beat Purdue. So, so you figured that one out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was on the road too. I, it's, it, yep. I, I so much rather play a second game against Purdue than a second game is against a team like Minnesota because like a Minnesota it's so hard to like 
get anything quality net wise out of that win. It, you know, if you beat them by 30, that'll give you a little bit of a bump, but I'd much rather play Purdue. I do want to touch back on the attendance though. Like the capacity of the rack is only 8,000 people. And we almost doubled that at the garden. The announced mm-hmm. attendance was 14,844 for the game. I think the, the max capacity at MSG is something like 17,000. So, you know, we, you know, 85% of the arena was sold out. It was, you know, 90% Rutgers fans. I think that's a feather in the cap of, you know, expanding the rack a little bit as much as you possibly can. Cause I, I don't, I think we'll be able to sell, you know, 10,000 seats out if that is what expands. I don't think it'll be that big, but I agree. I think there should be at least one game there every year. Ideally it's a big name opponent that doesn't travel like a game like Michigan state, not, not necessarily a conference game, but a game that you can really hype up and a fan base that like a Duke would suck to play. Cause that'll be a half Duke fans. A UConn mm-hmm. will be a lot of UConn fans. You know what but you think too about that? that UConn would, yeah. would be fun. That would be fun. And I was also thinking, even if you play like a low, like kind of a, a, a I guess, mid-major, a local mid-major, I think that would be cool because it's like for them, let's just throw mm-hmm. a name out, like a Wagner or a, or a Mom, Iona. Iona or something like that. Yeah, it's you like know? those teams never get to this. Like those kids would normally never get a chance to play at Madison Square Garden. So this could be their, you know, one chance to actually play on a stage like that. They, I mean, if you're Rutgers, it's kind of you'd expect it to be an easy win. But, like, maybe not Iona. Iona would be pretty tough. But if you're playing, like, you <laughs> yeah. know, a, t- a smaller team, like, for if you look at it from Rutgers' standpoint, it's that we're building that connection. We're getting kind of maybe an easier non-conference win. And if you look at it from the other team's perspective, I mean, yeah, it stinks that you might get, you know, your doors blown in, but it's like you get to play at Madison Square Garden, and it's like that's probably the one, maybe one chance they're ever going to get to play at Madison Square Garden. So I think that could be kind of a win-win scenario, too. I'm glad you said that because Izzo mentioned it too. He's like, this is the garden. This is still the Mecca. I yeah. had someone arguing with me. Shout out to Rob on Twitter who follow, like replies to all my shit. <laughs> Love it. Um, but he, uh, he said, he's like, do, do, do these kids, like these young kids like Harper and all them really care about the garden? I'm like, yes. Absolutely. I'm a Nets yeah. fan. Die hard. I hate yeah. the Knicks. That place <laughs> is just awesome though to play in. Yeah. Just even yeah. sit in there, watch a game. Yeah. Like I went to Knicks games before and I'm like, shit, this is kind of cool. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. the thing about the garden is like they're like some of the smartest basketball fans in the world where like they'll cheer on like greatness. Like there's been so many times where an away player has had just a fantastic night and they get standing ovations playing at the garden. Like it's, every player tries, you know, t- tries to like show out for the garden. It's a huge deal. Um, and one game a year, I mean, I think Rutgers was supposed to play Gonzaga at the garden a few years ago during the, uh, during the year, the, the pandemic happened and then that didn't work out because yeah. of New Jersey's uh, pandemic rule. I'm not, Richie, look, you look to be weird there. Is that not the case? They were very close to playing. Uh, I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Gonzaga, but they were very close to They had a plan in place to play Gonzaga. This oh, wait, wait, I think it was Baylor. I think it was Baylor. It was Baylor. It was Baylor. Baylor. Oh, it was Baylor. Yeah. You're right. Sorry. They sorry, played Gonzaga this, pat- this season, but they this backed season. out last minute because they're a bunch of pussies. <laughs> well, we would have beat the fucking brakes off them this year, too. Gonzaga's yeah. not good. Yep. You, Timmy, in your million dollar contract. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, yeah. nil deal. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, but as, as a wise old man once said yesterday, he was yelling at a cloud. That team bought their team, and that's why we lost. Oh my god, <laughs> Jim Beheim, total <laughs> fucking crybaby. Pays for you know he buys teams for years at Syracuse. Like I'm sure L- Lamelo went up there because he loved. Fucking winners. Lamello. See, that's yeah. the issue. You said Lamello. No, I said Mello. Uh, I thought I'm you said Lamello. No, no, I said Mello. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, don't Carmelo disrespect, no, <laughs> disrespect on. one of the greatest Knicks of all time. Fucking loser. Yeah. Never won shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, just, he got to the second round of the playoffs once. Give him some credit. <laughs> yeah, we did too, but we yeah. just we can't get past it either. It's rough. Yeah. Um, yeah, going, back the, uh, uh, going back to the going back to the National Garden talk. I know somebody asked uh, Pykel after the game. He just he was like, "Hey, would you want to play? You know, game a year? You know, at the Garden?" Pike was like, "Well, you know, I like playing at the rack." So <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's more he doesn't want to give up the home game. If you if they told him you're not, it's a neutral game or something like that, he'd be fine. But the fact that they took away. And consider well the fact that they considered a home game point. Is what pissed them off. Which yeah, taking right. away a conference home game is brutal, especially yeah. when you're playing a team twice in one year. We play one game at at Michigan State and the other at the Garden. That's bullshit. Yep. Do you, do you think he's like contractually I'm, I'm obliged? Jesus Christ, that was a contractually. Word. Um, <laughs> uh, oh my God. Do you think he has to say Jersey Mike's Arena 
in his yeah, yes, they all do. It's I, yeah, yeah, yes. well, not, even if he's not describing the arena, like just say it's like totally something completely random. Do you think he just has to mention it once per like, yes, you'll like, get he will get yelled at by the AD. I, I get not not like Pat hops <laughs> directly, but. I'm saying you don't have to say rack, but do you think like he just has to mention like the arena once, like every press conference? It's just like, oh, hey, well, it's pretty hard not Steve, to mention. It seems like your extension is you have to mention <laughs> the word, <laughs> the words, Jersey Mike's. Anything else that we don't care what you say, but you have to say Jersey Mike's in there somewhere. And it's I think like, he's yeah, a team we lost, player. we lost in Carver Hawkeye today, but you know, Jersey Mike's. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic submarine sandwiches. If you haven't already, try their new chicken <laughs> Baja Blast. Yeah. Cliff had a couple yeah. of stuffs in this one. And speaking of stuffs, you, know, you stuff your face with <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, yeah. they really should have some kind of NIL program with the Rutgers basketball team. Sure. Get Danny DeVito there. Like, There's that's, so much that Jersey Mike's it. could be doing. Yeah. We, we need to make a pitch. Mike, I feel like you're really good at this, like, uh, this whole speech, public speaking thing. Mm-hmm. Just give me a pitch for why Danny DeVito needs to be at Rutgers on the sideline. I, don't know, All right. Just, I mean, easy yeah. enough. Jersey native. He's a proud New Jerseyan. Rutgers State University of New Jersey. Perfect mm-hmm. fit there. Jersey Mike's. Obviously, he's the spokesperson. The name's on the arena. Why has this not happened yet? Like, Danny DeVito, just at the Rutgers Athletic Department. That would be the biggest standing ovation since Aiden Terry's three pointer. <laughs> if you had Danny DeVito try it out on court, and just hype the crowd up, take a big bite of a, an Italian sandwich, got balsamic vinegar spraying yep. out of his mouth as he screams, let's go, Rutgers. Get him on the court. I sh- I'm sure he has a house in New Jersey. This guy would be willing to come down and put on a show. Contact him. Let's get him Let's get him out to a Rutgers game. Come on. Now. And if you want to make the road fans happy too, do it against like Temple or like Villanova or something, you know. Yeah, and in the future, if we have a Philly team, perfect fit, have him come running out. In his bed gear, crawling out of the the, the couch sofa with Charlie. Just under- yeah, it's yeah, his, just uh, his underwear. <laughs> just have him go. We <laughs> got to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, but I want to give I want to give more of a shout out to Paul because we we both we everybody's talked about how good of a performance he had, but the dude had 17 second half points. Just totally carried the offense, especially after you know Mawat was the leading scorer, and then he gets hurt. Paul put the team on his back down the stretch. Um, I don't know if anybody scored that many points in, in a half for Rutgers this year, um, but he scored 17 of the 42 second half points for Rutgers. Mm-hmm. He was just making plays left and right. Um, he had a clutch three pointer in the corner yeah. um, late in the game. Uh, he hit some clutch three or about free throws late in the game as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's clearly the MVP of this game. Um, big shout out to Paul. Yeah, I remember yeah. he had those back-to-back kind of layups where he just drove to the drove in, and that kind of I think opened up the game a little bit because I think they put them up at like seven with like two minutes to go, and from there it was kind of like Rutgers just now it was just all about hitting your free throws, and they yeah they so they started doing a lot of pick and roll with Cliff, and then obviously you know Paul Paul just got downhill, and even even Izzo after the game you know mentioned that Rutgers just started attacking the ball or start started attacking the rim, and, and that really changed changed the game. Uh, but it, it's actually it's actually funny. Me and Craig were talking about this d- during the game. How um, a lot a lot of times they shoot the ball from the outside and 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 post up in the first half, and then they do in the second half they do pick and rolls and get to the hoop. Um, you know they should maybe start with the pick and rolls and then um, either attack either attack the rim and and give the ball to Clef to dunk it, or if they're both not there, then kick it out to Cam for for a three or something like that. So we'll we'll see if uh, how it changes that with Mag out, but. I also think it has to be a, a season high in, in terms of free throw attempts for the team. They, sh- they shot 34 free throws this game. Yeah. Now, yeah. The, the the other side of that coin is they went 22 for 34. Uh, so they yeah. only shot about 64% from the line. Another putrid performance from beyond the arc for this team. They went three for 16 from three. Oh, this, God. This is what, the, the, the fourth or fifth game in a row they've really struggled from deep. Mm-hmm. Um I don't count the Minnesota game because if you guys listen to the, the Geo podcast, he was basically saying, like, it's the worst defense he's ever seen a Big Ten team play. It's like shooting practice out there. Um, <laughs> the Rutgers did shoot 50% from the from three-pointer – from from three against Minnesota. But actually, they shot 40% against Iowa, too. Um, but this is just we're, – we're not consistent, which is what I think the problem is. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, what, what's Sadie doing over there? Uh, sniffing her uh, new stuff. Got a bark box, got a bunch of stuff. Um, oh, man. Anyway, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, so I, I, we didn't talk about it, I don't think, enough. 
like they just dominated the paint in the second half. They made Michigan State look yeah. weak. They mm-hmm. looked small. Mm-hmm. That was bully ball. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's their and now, game. And, if, and now yeah. officially after yesterday, Quiff is officially averaging a double double. He almost has more nice. rebounds and points, which is wild. well actually Michigan State surprisingly they out rebounded Rutgers in the game forty four to thirty four. Yeah, by ten, yep. Yeah. That, that was more so the, the second half, half, I feel like. Yeah, the second half they definitely turned it around, but it wasn't by any means like a, a domination by Rutgers on the boards. Mm-hmm. Especially like they had, it was so weird how like Rutgers will like the t- they'll okay, so Michigan State took a, like a bunch of threes, I felt like yesterday. And they would so, and they would hit the rim and just go bounce right back to Michigan State, which is like yeah. Yep. Rutgers, I don't know. It's like Rutgers got a really kind of bad luck with some of those with some of those rebounds. <laughs> yep, that's fair. Uh, but at, at the same time, it's it seems like that's happened to us all year, where mm-hmm. like we just haven't been boxing out well enough to get those opportunities. Because sometimes it just like springs back right to the three point line. There's really nothing you could do about it. But a lot of these were like kind of bouncing right around the foul line, and Rutgers just wasn't in position to get those rebounds. Um, just a weird rebounding day, a little bit. Um, but down the stretch, when we needed them, when Michigan State was fouling us, taking the ball off the court and trying to like get a quick basket, Rutgers was getting every one of those rebounds. So, and Cliff had a few really crucial yeah. offensive rebounds and putbacks. Uh, Cliff had another, Cliff was another guy who had a great game. He had another double-double. I want to say he's like close to the, the lead in the Big Ten for double-doubles in the season. I don't think anybody's going to catch a guy like Zach Eady, but uh, he's, you know, continuing to have a really strong season. Um, yeah, just yeah, a I, great game I, overall. I thought I thought when Rutgers was making his comeback in the second half, and then once it got its lead and trying trying to keep Michigan State away, I mean, they were playing tough defense, and then Cliff would sky up and get really tough rebounds, and yeah. they wouldn't let Michigan State get more than one chance. And that was I thought that was huge, uh, you know, late in the game, second half. Yeah. So we covered a ton here. Is there anything we haven't talked about, guys, uh, regarding this game that we wanted to hit on? So I know I know the fouls ended up being kind of similar, but the fouls called against Rutgers a lot of the times were just yeah. like, so bad. <laughs> I mean, there was like I, I'm pretty sure they missed a goal ten in the first. In, at, at some point, they had yeah, the Cam Spencer block. Yeah, Cam Spencer block. That well, I think I think that was actually a block. But that I was there was another time I was thinking of that it looked like a goal ten in the first half. Um, there was like fouls on Paul that were really bad. A foul on Caleb. Uh, it looked like the ref maybe thought he pulled the he, he pulled the Michigan State guy away from the ball, but he didn't. He just put his, he didn't do anything. Like it was so. But I mean, that's I mean, I know I know teams normally get a home whistle in the Big Ten. Obviously, Rutgers was considered the home team in this one, but they were not considered. Uh, but you know, they weren't getting the home whistle. You know. Yeah, I think it was no, the Oscar that- one that probably pissed off the. Yeah, the crowd the most was when I think it was like he was. It looked like he was like I don't know. He's just like he was trying to box out or something. And he, he like didn't even really touch the guy, and he got yeah. whistled for a uh, foul. And place started going crazy. So yeah, it was that was pretty pretty weird. I agree. So Rutgers, I believe, in like to start the second half, I think they had uh, seven fouls like within the first like eight minutes of the game. I think they had like Michigan was in the bonus starting at like the eleven minute mark. Michigan yeah, State was yeah, in the bonus yeah. starting at like eleven yeah. minute mark. Uh, so Rutgers was really kind of just like, you know, kind of screwed for the entire second half with the foul calls. Uh, one other point, now that Mag looks like he might be out for an extended period of time, I think we started to see some of the cracks in our depth because, you know, we're filling that Mag role in with a combination of Reber, Palmquist, and Jalen Miller. And those guys, you know, while, while Palmquist was like a nice story against Minnesota, he was, you know, he didn't look great yesterday. Yeah. And Reber, I thought, looked better than I mean, he only played two minutes. But this this depth is really going to be tested in, in big games going down the stretch if we if Mag is out for an extended period. I was actually surprised that like Hyatt didn't really play much in the second half. They gave yeah, a lot of runs yeah. to Simpson and, uh, and Palmquist there. Yeah, he had a rough shooting day. He was one for six on the day, uh, over four from three. Um, yeah, I mean he's. He's the kind of guy that, like, we're going to need him down the stretch to have those kind of, like, really hot second halves that he's shown to be able to have, uh, especially if Mag's out 
or he might be a starter moving forward. Who knows? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it really stinks. It honestly really stinks to see Mag go down if it's an extended if yeah. it's here. Because it felt like he was just really starting to come on his own because it's like mm-hmm. he was yep. always kind of the defensive, you know, like glue, like glue guy, I guess. But, like, now you could see as the first game he scored, like, seven of their first, like, 13 points. I And you could see he was starting to develop more of an offensive game. It just like it just felt like it was all starting to come together for Mag. So to see him go down and to see him possibly be out for extended period of time really stinks because it feels like – He's always. I feel like we've always known he could become this type of player, but it's always kind of the injury bug. I feel like has always been kind of creeping around the corner for him. So it just it just stinks. Yeah, he's really developed his his intermediate shot. Like he's got a really nice turnaround. Like he's you know starting to develop a really nice corner three as well. Um, and Geo, I mean, he couldn't speak more highly of of Mag when we talked to him. He was mm-hmm. you know. Like Pike, one of Pike's like ultimate success stories. Yeah, I, I I really would feel awful for this kid if he's if he's out for you know if he has a serious injury. I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, yeah. it's nothing so, too major. So you dummies on the board, stop saying bench him for Andre Hyatt. Like just <laughs> yeah. stop. It doesn't make sense. Like yeah. he doesn't yeah. score. Now he Who doesn't. cares? He plays <laughs> defense. Like, yeah, I said yeah. It, I said it on the podcast a couple I don't know, at some point recently that. You know, high high can score. He just has to be more consistent. And, and yeah. if he if he can do that, it just opens up everything so much more. And but you know, we haven't we haven't seen that yet. But if he's able to do that, obviously he might get more more minutes now. You know, starting and everything like he did early in the season. So um, he's going to have his chance. And you know, like like yesterday, he, if he's if he's not you know shooting well and playing good defense, then he's going to be back on the bench. You know, for Oscar or 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 or, uh, or, 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 or like someone like like Reber or something like that. Yep, and it's all about confidence because he hits the Ohio State three, and all of a sudden now he's become more of an offensive threat. So it's like, ah, oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> I hope yeah, he loves Hyatt too. Yeah. Uh, like he's just he doesn't complain. He's, he seems like the perfect teammate. Like this is a really highly rated kid out of high school who played a lot for a tournament team at LSU. He comes to Rutgers, comes you know the sixth man for this team, and it seems like he's you know he's a total team dude. So I I really hope that he steps into this role. And elevates uh, his his game a bit here with Mag being out for some kind of extended period. Sorry, Rich, what were you saying? No, I'm, I'm eager to see Oscar. Like I, I I've seen him be so athletic before. If he just has an inch of confidence, this man could be a really decent piece for Rutgers. Like uh, I'm, I'm eager to see this. He does seem to be in his head a bit because he had mm-hmm. one really, you know, weird turnover early in the game. He had that one like inbounds pass from under the basket that seemed like he just like looked away from at the last second and it bounced mm-hmm. off his hand. Um, I do agree though, that he, he looks like a guy, you know, cause he's what, like six ten. he's a lefty. Mm-hmm. He's known as a shooter. Like this is a guy that, you know, if he could reach his potential, he's a very valuable piece, but it seems like it is a, a confidence thing. Mm. Yeah, if, yeah. I mean, if he can hit his outside shots and be kind of, I guess, another score, I guess, alongside Cam, then I think you can probably live with maybe a little bit of a step down and from a, a defensive perspective, because then it, like it opens up more of your offensive game. So that's kind of yeah. kind of the mix and match you can you kind of I guess you can kind of play here. But it's just all about you know I guess confidence and just can being able to continue to hit your shot. Yeah, and everyone everyone says Oscar is like one of the best teammates on the team. So I mean, yeah. obviously he's he's well liked. Um, but pro- probably the one thing that. Maybe he's not the best at it. It's probably his defense. I noticed they go to zone a lot when when he's in the game. Uh, maybe that's because of him. Maybe that's just a coincidence that I, I noticed. But uh, yeah, I mean, he has a nice a nice shooting, uh, you know, motion and form and everything like that. So um, if he can, if he's able to make one, like I said, it brings his confidence level so much higher. Um, he made he made his shot against Minnesota and ends up having a career game. He played a lot of minutes. Um, yeah, and he's gonna get a lot of minutes now. And uh, you know, this is this might be his chance. Yeah, I think that's what really is going to test this team moving forward is if he if Mag isn't out there, like you were just able to throw Mag and McConnell on the two best offensive players, regardless of position, other than like a Zach Eady type for the opposing team. And it was basically just like this chameleon defense. Like you weren't going to get an easy shot on either Mag or McConnell. And while Cam Spencer, you know, and Paul McKay, he aren't like the fastest guys. They're really good defenders. They're opportunistic. Mm-hmm. They're smart. So they know like, OK, if I come in and double right now, when this guy's, you know, about to like do a spin move, I can reach in and get this get this ball. So they're like, it's a very high IQ defense. And not that the, the, you know, the guys on the bench aren't, but you know, a lot of these guys are used to playing with one another and used to Mag taking a very important role in that defense. So it's going to be tough to replace him. That's, I mean, we keep you know circling around this, but 
I, I also thought that Caleb had one of his best games of the season defensively. He was just totally like shutting down everybody mm -hmm. from, you know, you know, steals to clutch rebounds. He just, nobody got an easy shot on Caleb yesterday. Could be back to back, you know, defensive player of the year. You know, I guess you never know. Could be. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I, I guess we kind of exhausted most topics from this game. Um, for those of you who have not heard already, there's going to be a live event on Tuesday at the Olive Branch for the Rutgers Indiana game. I believe it starts at six o'clock. Uh, I might be wrong there, but the game is at six thirty. Um, sounds like it's going to be a big turnout. Um, it's co-hosted co by the Knight Society, by the front office and Rutgers rivals. I believe uh, a Night and Day Apparel is also sponsoring it, and a few other sponsors as well. It's going to be a good Asbury time. Asbury Park Brewery, baby. Asbury Park Brewery. Um, <laughs> Geo Baker is going to be there. Victor Kanaka from the football team is going to be there. Riley Tiernan from the women's soccer team is going to be there. Sounds like Adam Corsak is going to be there as well, fresh off of his Senior Bowl appearance. Anybody who hasn't seen the punt he had that went Rutgers viral from the Senior Bowl. Or Twitter, whatever. He had an awesome punt in the game that was down at the one-yard line. Um, it sounds like from everything coming out of the Senior Bowl, uh, he had really good performance in practice all week. It sounds like he's the number one punter by a lot of scouting services. So we we might see Adam Forsak get, get drafted. There's not many punters who get drafted. So if there aren't any nope. drafted, um, he'll it might actually be a better situation for him because then he'll pick his team. Um, and for a special team, or if you could pick your team, you most likely can you know pick where you're going to start because not many teams have a punting opening year after year. Yeah. I know the Jets could use him. They need a lot the Jets, more. Yeah, <laughs> but that is one problem. Yeah, that should be uh, that should be item number about seventeen on the list this offseason for the Jets. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, if you can make it out, there's still tickets available. We posted a link to that on the board and also in the uh, the article from our, our interview with Geo. If you mm -hmm. haven't listened to that, obviously he dropped so many interesting nuggets, some recruiting nuggets, you know, some nuggets about the team. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a bit ever, a bit of evergreen content. That just means you can listen to it and it's still timely whenever you, you hear it. And he also talks about the event. Uh, but again, thanks again for listening, guys. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Rate us on your favorite podcasting app. Uh, but for me and the rest of the guys, it's been another edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off. Frank Rutgers.